Welcome to the RC3. Hello and welcome on the Franconian.net stage. We now have the pleasure to present the next talk called Fathers Like Lego, held by Andrea and Dominic. They both are developers for AFL++ and they are creating a new fuzzing library. If you are new to it, fuzzing means to randomly input data into a program until it starts to crash. From there on, the input data will be changed to trigger more crashes or specific behavior. Have fun. Welcome to our talk, Feathers Like Lego. We, that's Andrea Fioraldi and me, Dominic Meyer, are going to talk a bit about um, building blocks today. Not like these, we all know that uh, Congress loves Legos, but we're going to talk about how software and specifically Feathers, um, an automated scheme to test software for security vulnerabilities, can be built and bricked together. So, First, let me introduce ourselves. Um, we're both academics doing our PhDs at universities around Europe. Um, and we both play CTF. And we're both part of uh, the AFL++ team. For whoever is not really familiar with fuzzing, um, AFL is one of the most uh, well-known fuzzers around. And AFL++ is a fork that is maintained by a group of uh, four people, us two, and uh, Mark and Heiko. We managed to increase the fuzzing performance, overall performance, execution speed, and also just uh, path finding and, and bug finding over the course of the last one and a half years pretty dramatically. Here you can see um, the fast bench. Uh, experiment summary. So FuzzBench is a, a pretty good offering by Google, giving Fuzzer authors the possibility to test their Fuzzers against real targets. And here you can see AFL++ 268C in comparison to AFL++ 3.0, which is the latest version and which is pretty advanced in comparison to the old school AFL when at the time we forked it. So yeah, um, would we want to say that AFL++ is the best fuzzer around? Um, well, we get many fuzz bench points, so yeah, we have a great success here. But the truth about fuzzing is that AFL++ isn't the best fuzzer. Actually, um, the best fuzzer is Honkfuzz. No. Um, the best fuzzer is, uh, of course, the Frida API fuzzer, which uses Frida to fuzz. No. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, the best fuzzer is libfuzzer. Uh, which is um, included in a client project. And, no. Uh, the best is Unicore Fuzz, which can fuzz pretty much anything that you have a CPU out. No. Ah, the best fuzzer is Fuzili, which fuzzes... No. Uh, no? Uh, no. The best fuzzer is the original. No. Uh, the best fuzzer is Tomato, which is specifically bro uh, for browsers. No. And, uh, Dom no? Okay. Hmm. Well, then... Uh, ah, mm, I know. Usually the best fuzzer is your custom fuzzer, which is tuned for that specific use case um, and adapted to your specific needs. So it may come with custom mutations that are only useful for you know, weird XML dialects of your target, um, or you know, the, there's no off-the-shelf fuzzer for this specific weird architectural thing that you try to fuzz. Um, well, that leaves us with a bit of a problem here, because if I can't use an off-the-shelf fuzzer, how would I create a fuzzer? Well, the usual way is to just fork an existing fuzzer. That's why we have a lot of AFL forks out there. Yes, I know it's funny coming from a guy who just uh, told you all about their awesome AFL fork, uh, but it's true. We try our AFL plus plus fork actually tries to incorporate many of these, but of course uh, it's impossible to incorporate all of them. Um, well, the other way is to, you can create a whole puzzle from scratch, which, you know, of course, works, but that way you don't reuse any existing code. You will have to spend a lot of time just like doing basic engineering things. 
uh, um, you adopt different techniques from different puzzles. You have to, you know, stop GitHub. You reinvent the wheel, and uh, in the end, you will end up with a more naive design. So, getting to the point of uh, specialization um, and to like a performance of, you know, something like AFL, AFL plus plus, or HomePass, it takes a lot of engineering effort. And for like a rear target, you are not going to put that much effort into it. And then lastly, you, you will not be able to just take your one core fuzzer and scale it to many cores and many machines with these, without even more additional engineering. So, I mean, it's in the title of the talk already, but how would you go about uh, building something that's reusable? Well, our solution is a fuzzing library. Um, our goal is it to build a library that can be used to develop custom fuzzes quickly and easily. The library offers you basic blocks that can be put together to a proper working fuzzer, and each of these blocks can be exchanged, can be amended, the community can uh, add their own um, blocks, and you can then put the perfect fuzzer for your target together with not too many lines of code. Now we're going to go through each of these components in fine details. Andrea? In um, the following part of this talk, we'll present the concept that we define to abstract the properties of fuzzers. We will give some example, a very simple example that related to fuzzers that you should already know, like a fuzz, fuzzer, and so on. So we relate uh, this abstraction to some possible implementation. Uh, we will show some bits of uh, this uh, entity translated to, to code, that is Rust in our case, and we hope that the community will profit and learn about uh, this new vision of fuzzing as uh, building blocks. And all these parts should be swappable, uh, can be replaced uh, without any kind of problems with the other parts. So if, for instance, you can define a new type of mutator, swap it with the pre-existing mutator, and all the other stuff works without problems with your new mutator. The first component that we will discuss is the observation channel or uh, observer as an abbreviation. That is uh, the entity that uh, provides some information uh, about the a specific run of the target. This information live inside uh, the target. They uh, we usually read only, so just uh, no, the fuzzer doesn't uh, use observation channel to instruct the target, they just, the fact they just observe, so it's a passive channel, and uh, it is usually deterministic, but uh, not in all the cases. A very, very straightforward it's example that you for sure will know uh, is the FL, uh, FL observation channel, that is a, is a map in a shared memory, that logs in each bucket, uh, that represent uh, an edge in the control from graph. The number of uh, execution of such edges in the current uh, execution of the program. Another very simple observation channel used by offshore shell fuzzer is the execution time. When the test case uh, is fit to the target and the target is run, fuzzer measure time, typically in milliseconds, and uh, no, uh, for each test case, uh, how much time is needed to execute it. But uh, apart this very common type of observation that uh, Fuzzer does ab about targets, as the spirit of the library is uh, fully abstract, you can define, for instance, uh, a new type of observation, like in this case, reach availability or the program point. You define the code, a uh, target program point, and the observation, the data of the observation challenge uh, channel is just a boolean that says yes or no if uh, the current run reached uh, this uh, target program point. We discussed uh, the observation channels that uh, we are deeply connected with the target and uh, 
the data live inside the target we saved, but how we can instruct the target uh, about uh, doing something. And the component uh, for this purpose is the executor that basically instructs the target about the current input and run uh, the iteration, uh, run a false case, runs the target with the given input. For instance, if you if you target in, runs inside an emulator, the executor uh, will place the input in a determined uh, area of the memory in the emulator and uh, start the execution of the emulator uh, to run uh, the, the target with the given input. This is just an, an example. Uh, the executor is deeply associated with the observation channel. In our design, they are even contained inside the executor. And uh, a possible example, the most simple example of executor comes from Lips Fuzzer, is uh, the in-memory executor, that in which uh, the input is just passed as an argument to an harness function, and the execution of the target program is just the execution of this function. It is the most uh, most simple possible executor that you can you can imagine. Another more complex example that you know is the for server of the DFL that is a more complex um, mechanism to control the target using uh, inter-process communication pipeline between two processes. That one is the fuzzer. There is an intermediate process that is a copy of the target that uh, each time that the fuzzer requests a new execution using the, the pipe fork itself in, a, in the target child that is the actual real target uh, process that is fuzzed and when the target child exit is uh, communicated again to the intermediate fork server that uh, communicate uh, the outcome using another pipe to the fuzzer so there is the double indirection uh, executor in FL. Now we discuss the feedback entity that uh, is the entity that uh, manages to handle the, the data inside the observation channels. The main purpose of feedback is to produce a fitness value that say if the state of the observation channels uh, are interesting, that means that uh, that is case that uh, is related to the last execution of the executor is interesting that means that uh, it can be added to the corpus of the fuzzer this corpus uh, is evolved uh, during the fuzzing algorithm it's uh, for instance used for mutations and so on so it's a score again it's a, it's a function with a state that assign a score to the executions and uh, if the score is uh, Okay, the, the test case is added to this corpus. A very straightforward example of uh, feedback uh, is uh, the one that is used in uh, almost all the of the shared fuzzer, that is the maximization map. There is a map uh, like the map that you see in, in the map server, but uh, it is uh, inside the fuzzer this time. It is an history map that keeps track of the maximum value since so far in the, all the cumulative uh, observations made in all the executions. In a test case uh, is defined as interesting when the state uh, of the map observation channel uh, is uh, as an entry that has uh, a value that is greater than uh, the corresponding entry in the history map uh, in the feedback. When this happens, the entries in the feedback is also updated, so it's always uh, the state of the feedback is always evolved. A very simple usage of the maximization map is to maximize the, the coverage, uh, the, the number of the execution of the ages in FL, for instance. Uh, the code is very similar to this one. If uh, there is a, the, an entry that is greater uh, uh, in the observation channel that is greater than the one in the history map, uh, the history map is updated and the fitness is increased. Um, but the very same feedback, uh, so very same code, very same implementation can be used to do a very different job uh, that will result in a very different outcome of the fuzzer, uh, but changing a little a very few lines of code in the target. 
to report instead of the number of the execution of the edges, uh, the size of the allocations, for instance, in one of the possible uh, usage of a maximization map, as we want to maximize the size of malloc to spot out of memory bugs, for instance. Now, fuzzing uh, as, a, as an objective that in most of the cases to find uh, violation of some requirements, you know, like crashes, timeouts, uh, violation of some invariants of the program, and so on. But uh, as we like abstraction, we define uh, the objective uh, of the fuzzer as a set of uh, objective feedbacks that are just feedbacks that are just like the normal feedbacks that we discussed, but uh, that provide an interest, is interesting uh, result uh, to add the test case, not to the corpus that he use uh, in the fuzzer for the evolution of the state of the fuzzer, but in the objective corpus, that is the corpus that is not used anymore by the fuzzer, it's just for the user that they say, in this uh, set of test cases, there are test cases that uh, comply with your definition of objective for the fuzzer. For instance, in this objective corpus, there are the test cases that crash the acquisition in the normal case. Or uh, in a more uh, strange case, we reuse again the example of reachability. We can define uh, the reaching of a specific program point uh, as an objective of the fuzzer. And so, for instance, we can start fuzzing with an invalid input, uh, put a reachability condition in a portion of the code that we know is reached only with an invalid input. And so, in the end, uh, in the objective corpus, we will have uh, all uh, valid test cases for the output. A very important entity, of course, in fuzzing, uh, it's, it is the input that we define not as the input that is expected by the target, but as uh, the input that uh, is used inside the fuzzer. What this means that uh, the input is uh, the structure that the fuzzer expects to easily manipulate uh, the input, uh, this, uh, this structure, and then uh, uh, communicate the target uh, an input uh, also with another format. For instance, uh, uh, if we define an input as a structure with fields and uh, um, enums and so on, uh, maybe the target expect uh, a byte array. Uh, the fuzzer can easily manipulate this uh, struct uh, inside um, the code, but then uh, when in the execute or we instruct the target about the input, uh, we serialize uh, this, uh, this input structure. A complex example of input can be the abstract Synta tree. Imagine a grammar-based fuzzer, and we store these test cases as uh, three, not byte arrays. Then maybe the, the target we expect a byte array, but inside the fuzzer we manipulate the tree with three operations, like can link and uh, append and so on. Uh, for instance, in a mutator, we, we can swap nodes and so on. And uh, when uh, the input uh, must be put inside the target, this is serialized to the format that is expected by the target. Another component is the corpus. We discussed about it already. We talked about it as a set of test cases, but it's not just a set of test cases. In our model, a corpus is a the place in which the, there are stored interesting inputs and their metadata. What are metadata? Metadata are uh, all the information that are not uh, internal of the input, uh, like the execution time, uh, the new entries of the coverage map that are discovered uh, the first time that uh, this, this case uh, was added to the corpus, and so on. So these uh, Properties are related to the test case that is in the corpus and just to the test case in this corpus. They are external, so they cannot be stored in the input structure. But the definition of corpus doesn't end here because it defines also a policy about how the, the fuzzer should request this case to the corpus. The fuzzer, each iteration, uh, requests a test case from the corpus, uh, and the most naive implementation of this policy is a random policy. When the fuzzer requests a test case, the corpus gives a random test case. 
but you can also follow up the third approach and uh, each time that a fuzzer you get a test case you can uh, uh, serve a test case with a first in first out approach uh, using a queue and so on the mutator component of course uh, is very important because uh, is uh, the most used uh, way to generate inputs in feedback uh, driven fuzzing and the definition is very simple one of more tech inputs are taken and a new derived uh, input is generated it can be very simple, just uh, one mutation, a bit flip. Or complex with like a scheduler mutator that uh, apply multiple mutation and also have some scheduling policies uh, that can be defined uh, to apply this mutation. And uh, the two policies can be how many mutation uh, the, the mutator should apply each run and which mutation uh, it should apply. In a basic fuzzers like FL, these policies are random but in more advanced solutions like MOPT, uh, scheduling algorithms can be applied, like uh, in MOPT, uh, which mutation is selected using an history of the effectiveness of each mutation. And so mutations that lead to interesting inputs have more priority in the selection of mutation. Deeply connected to the mutator, there is the generator that uh, generates inputs this time from scratch and take as input some parameters, for instance, the probability to expand some rule in a grammar when generating uh, a test case from scratch using a grammar. Generators are used to generate the initial corpus uh, in case in which the user doesn't provide the funds in the initial corpus or part of the mutator as a mutation. You generate from scratch a part of the input, not just the entire input and so on. In some strange cases, it can be used also as a post-process uh, step in fuzzing. You evolve not a real input representation, but a set of probabilities, and before uh, sending the input to the target, there is a post-process st stage that uh, generates the actual input, taking uh, this set of probabilities uh, as, uh, as parameter. The most simple policy to generate an input can be a random array with some other uh, requirements like just printable bytes and so on or even complex generators like grammar based generators that are used for instance in Nautilus also to mutate inputs because one of the possible mutations on Nautilus is to take a node in the, in the input replace it with a new generated separate tree from scratch so the mutator uses itself a generator as a mutation A very abstract component uh, also is the stage that is defined as the entity that operates an option on a single test case that is can mean, all, of course, nothing, it is uh, not explained. The idea is that the fuzzer uh, requests a test case from the corpus each uh, iteration and the stages are all these actions that are applied to just this uh, single test case that was uh, taken from the corpus. The most simple uh, stage that you think about in fuzzing is the mutational stage, that there is a loop. And uh, in this loop, uh, the test case is mutated using a mutator. Uh, it is executed and it is evaluated using uh, the feedbacks and then, uh, if interesting, added to the corpus. But uh, it can be also more complex. You can use a scheduling algorithm to uh, intelligent, we know how many iterations this loop must, must do. Uh, this is a very widely explored topic in literature, for instance, there are a lot of works that try to maximize the effectiveness of fuzzing, selecting this uh, number of iterations in FL, it's called, depends on the first score, and there are, for instance, works like FL Fast that find several scheduling policies that uh, depends, for instance, on uh, rare uh, portion of the codes and so on to sell, to give more iteration to interesting input and less iteration to shallow inputs. Another example of stage is the analysis stage. That is a stage that can, for instance, execute an additional executor that perform time tracking and collect the information with observer and store this information as metadata. 
and then you after that you can uh, for instance run another stage that make you of this uh, metadata that can be for instance uh, comparison values extracted from the target uh, to do mutation for instance that is a common uh, analysis stage used in uh, in fuzzers if you know fl uh, another example is the trim stage that uh, try to minimize the size of these cases by maintaining the same coverage uh, and so on there are you can define uh, cell also other different type of stage guys calibration and so on now I presented in theory what uh, for us are the core concept uh, core entities behind feedback during fuzzing in uh, an abstract way so they can be almost uh, translated to code not so it's uh, more easy to to say that to do but uh, they can and uh, but of course they are just theory and uh, to provide a real implementation we need additional components related to the implementation that Dominic will discuss for in the next uh, in the next slides thank you Andrea so these additional components that are not really theoretical background of fuzzing things but I actually needed for this library to work and for fuzzers to work. Um, let's take a little look at this. Um, so in our Lego house there are these parts on the, on the left. You see here already there's a display so we need something like output for the user. You see on the on the very top the blue stuff which communicates with some outside world um, and then there's also internals of this green thingy, which um, is the random number generator, for example. Um, so we actually benchmarked a, low, a lot of random number generators. It makes a huge difference of, uh, for execution speed, which RNG you use. Then we have, of course, you know, the state. Pretty easy to explain, right? It's the state. So it contains the corpus and the feedbacks and all entities. We had to split it up a bit, so the corpus is now like a separate thing, so it works well together with Rust. Uh, but from a core concept, you have this state, and each time you run an input, it may evolve the state and parts of the fuzzer. And then last but not least, and pretty importantly, we have an event manager. So each new event that occurs during fuzzing will be sent out during, uh, using an event manager. We have different implementations of the event manager, one of which just displays the changes to the user, which would allow for single core fuzzing, and another one which is called uh, low-level message passing event manager, which can pump out each event, so each time a new test case is found or um, metadata is added to a corpus, um, it can pump out this event to all other nodes that are fuzzing as well. This makes it easy to scale to all cores and in the future may even allow it, uh, us to scale across different machines. Um, the nice things about LLNP is that it is implemented uh, using shared maps. So very rarely does uh, any fuzzer instance need to go and ask the kernel for something. Usually everything is inside shared maps and all of the nodes that are fuzzing just listen for changes on the shared maps asynchronous so then code well the initial implementation of many of these well we involved them a bit but many of these concepts uh, was done last summer by uh, rishi during our google summer of code um a for plus plus summer of code um, and that may allowed us to test out all of these ideas however c is just it's showing its age, let's say, right now. So it doesn't have generics, which is pretty uh, useful for this kind of use case. Um, and it doesn't really allow an easy way to do object-oriented programming or any abstractions. So what we did was we rewrote the thing in C++, which is you know the logical next step. Um, that leads us to a lot of virtual functions, which is slower. Um, and then many different um, templating craziness to get away from the virtual functions. So here we are today talking about Rust implementation. Um, 
to conclude after a few weeks uh, in-depth rusting, uh, we can say that some language features are still missing, but uh, in overall, it's more legible and still performant in comparison to C++. We looked around the Rust community and we found a pretty good uh, keynote from RustConf18 about uh, game development. And the concepts we found inside this keynote, we then translated to Rust patterns for our fuzzing library. And then we ended up with a game state kind of thing, which is called the fuzzer state, which I already talked about earlier. Um, and the fuzzer state contains uh, feedback, executors, corpus, and stages, all the things you heard before. And then one very special unrusty Rust part is um, an animap. So there is the reason is that there are no real downcasts in Rust. So what we have now is a hash map that we put anything in, that hence the name AnyMap, and we get out the type that we put in later. So that way, each part in the fuzzing uh, pipeline, each part of the fuzzing pipeline can store and retrieve data at any point in time. Um, and then we evolved this concept further to Haskell-like tuples with the nice benefit that access is already checked at Compile. Um, and of course, what we really came to love is SERDE, which is the serialization and digitalization in Rust um, that takes a lot of effort of writing digitalization away from us. So let's go back to scaling. We saw that uh, just spawning a single thread on the glibc will enable footex on write, which makes fuzzing potentially slower if the target prints. Um, so we just said, you know, we don't have any threads. We have a single process in our example implementation. Um, and whenever an interesting test case is discovered, it's synced log free over these shared map channels. We have a marginal serialization overhead, but afterwards no more syncing is involved. This is pretty cool. Um, and we even added an option, if uh, all observers are the same for each client, we can reuse the results and we don't have to rerun um, the input for a target on a different fuzzer. So you can still have, you know, you can have clients that are not the same shape. So you could have one client that has, for example, additional instrumentation in that case, you would have to rerun. But if they're exactly the same fuzzer, they will just take over the test case from the other client um, and go on fuzzing with the new test case. You can see here that everything on these AD cores is green. Green means there is not much kernel involvement, which is what we strive for in fuzzing, because in AFL land, it's known that the kernel will usually slow down your fuzzing if you use it a lot. And you can also see here in this chart in the middle that we actually scale pretty well. So it's almost linear. For libpng, we have over 10 million execs on this machine uh, per second. You are probably wondering, well, now you chose Rust, fine, but I don't like Rust. Can I only use this library if I'm a Rust person? Um, no. So the cool thing is, this is only the core. Our libpmg test harness already used C++. We already have a uh, version using QEMU mode, which also works. It integrates flawlessly to our, in, uh, according to our tests. Uh, plus, the library is completely no standard lib and alloc, which you know, may tell Rust people something. It basically means you can include this potentially in a kernel later. Um, and almost all targets that um, any static client binary can be built for. The bad part is it's not done yet. We tried to finish it for the talk, but there's still some little engineering details here and there that we want to finish before we want to release it to the public. So you can already look at the old C lib, which already has the scaling aspects of it. Um, and you can expect the Rust rewrite to come really, really soon. If you're super interested, shoot us a message. We will let you know as soon as possible. We can also give you early access, maybe. Um, 
And a per plus burst, you know, will stay around for the normal use cases. So if you just want to plus, you can still do it with a plus plus. Thank you all for listening. Uh, we showed you the main fuzzing building blocks, and we showed you how we translated to our library right now, which will be out very soon. Um, we think that we chose good defaults, and we will provide examples like libfuzzer-like example that you can just use and adapt to your own harnesses um, and so you know follow our github project and us to uh, know more about updates and enjoy the rest of rc3 and thank you so much Okay, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, now let's have a look at the questions with Andrea and Dominic. Um, right now, as I see, there are no questions asked in the chat. So I have like two short questions that I would ask. And if you still have questions, we have a little bit of time. So please ask them right now. And you will still get through with it. So the first question, you already somewhat asked it. Um, so it uh, seems to be possible to fast applications that aren't written in Rust, right? Uh, yes, let's, uh, totally. So the core is written in Rust, the library. Yeah. But any any place that you can link Rust against, which is almost anything, you can uh, fast in the end. OK. And, uh, the library is uh, no standard lib, so uh, you don't even need uh, to have an operating system around it in the end. Oh, OK. Cool. Yeah. So you basically could also fast like embedded projects. Yeah, for sure. That's, ah. that's part of the plan. That sounds very good. And one more question for me is, um, uh, right now, you said you didn't release the source code. Is there like a place where we can update on the st uh, get updates on the status? Yeah, uh, so. the status uh, is <laughs> as soon as it pops up on our GitHub. Um, OK. Maybe uh, also the, the, the Discord channel, and that is the fuzzy Discord channel. Uh, uh, so, in which we usually post uh, information and updates about uh, the project. Okay, so there's a special Discord channel. Yeah. I'm not sure if we somehow can add it here. Maybe we could put it later down. And no, we can in the slides that we will re release, we can put a link. Yeah, okay. Um, I see there are some questions coming in. I'll look at the pad if they're already sorted. No. Um, I look directly in the IRC. Um, so, will the new thing be a tool or is it just a library? Andrea? Um, it is. It can be both. It is a library. Okay. And uh, alongside the library, we will provide some uh, default uh, configurations, default tools that are can be built uh, with a library that you can use as a tool or you can use as a skeleton for your own tool that uh, is based on the library. OK, great. For example, right now we already have uh, a libfuzzer clone running. So anything that takes LLVM, the standard LLVM input function that fuzzer people will know, you can already fuzz that using uh, the, well, it's the library in the end. But and we have QEMU also, executor that does fast snapshots that is uh, very fast uh, and uh, can be used to fuzz uh, binary only targets on uh, Linux. But the idea is that in the end you write your own few lines of uh, code to wrap it up and not have all the command line flags that you now specify for the existing fuzzing tools. Okay, cool. Um, another question from the chat is, um, did you try it yet on bare metal systems? Not that far yet. We know that it builds, but uh, there are some things still left. For example, um, to use this LLMP message passing, you need uh, some place that gives you um, a new shared map. And uh, this, you know, all this harnessing has to be done, and we've not tried it yet. Okay. So one more question. Um, 
I'm curious how pluggable mutators will be if I want to, for instance, for instance, tie in some more protocol grammar. Yes, you can just, uh, uh, if you want to do structured fuzzing, the two components that you want to override is the input because, uh, yeah, you need uh, some representation of your uh, uh, structure that is not just a butter array. And the mutator, the mutator is just Think about uh, an object in you know, any object-oriented uh, programming languages. Uh, there is a, you just define a new class and instantiate a new object of this uh, mutator class. The difference is, is here is the that uh, we even use generics and uh, classes are not a uh, concept in Rust. There are traits that are uh, quite similar, but not the same thing. Okay. All right. Um, I think right now there are no further questions. And yeah, so basically that sums it up. If you don't have anything left to say, I think we're done. Uh, one more thing about uh, this plugging in mutators. Uh, we are thinking about uh, making it possible also to write, you know, prototyping uh, in other languages, for example, Python, and then plug them in in like a generic fashion. But then if you really want to do fuzzing in the end, you should definitely use a low-level language instead because uh, yeah. the jump to Python is super slow. And, it is a uh, long-term uh, long uh, long uh, objective that we have to support Python. Because yes, it's low, but it's great for prototyping yeah. and experimenting uh, a new fuzzer. Okay, that sounds very good. All right, then I'll say thank you a lot again. Thank you so much for hosting. Thank you. And thanks to all the guys on the tech team, all the guys on the RC3 team. You're awesome. And have a nice day and enjoy the rest of it. Thanks. Bye. 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 Welcome to the RC3. Welcome to the RC3.